Well, what's going on, guys? I have chapter four of Furiously Happy here. If you are just joining us, I would highly recommend going back and listening to the first chapter on up through because this has been honestly pretty hilarious. Um, my friend Amanda actually recommended this book to me because, as you guys know, my channel is based around the outdoors how I handle my mental health, and how I just recenter my brain and my thoughts and how to make myself happy again. Um, If you've kept up with me on any of my other social medias, I've been going through some health issues. Uh, I have another doctor's appointment tomorrow uh, to figure some other things out and talk with my doctor and ask her questions. But um, it's nothing fatal. Everything's going to be fine. Um, I'm actually making myself some microwaved pizza rolls. Yum, yum. (laughs) So it's uh, no work tonight. Um, So, yeah, let's get into this. Chapter 4 of Furiously Happy by Jenny Lawson. This chapter, I have a sleep disorder and it's probably going to kill me or someone else. If you were to ask me, how did you sleep? I'll usually say, pretty well, all things considered, but today is a bit more complicated because this morning I lost both of my arms. On the bright side, it gave me something to write about, although it was, of course, impossible to write about at the time because I didn't have any working arms. In quotations, editor's note, start over, soundless, ludicrous. (laughs) Fine. This morning I got up at 6 a.m., to get Haley off to school, but then I went back to bed for a bit because I been been up till 3 a.m. having dead raccoon rodeo in the kitchen. Editor's note, you know what? Never mind. Again, folks, Jenny has all kinds of conditions. Uh, please go back to chapter one. You'll hear about all of those. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The dead raccoon's name was Rory. I fell in love with him the instant... I fell in love with him the instant I saw him because he looked exactly like Rambo, the rescued orphan raccoon who lived in my bathtub when I was little. Rory hadn't been lucky enough to be adopted by a small child who dressed him up in small short sets and let him turn her sink into his own tiny waterfall. Instead, Rory had fallen in with a bad crowd and ended up as roadkill. But my friend Jeremy, a... Oh, man, I can't pronounce that word. B-U-R-G. Burgeoning taxidermist. (laughs) Saw great potential and very few tire marks on the cadaver and decided that Rory's tiny spirit could live on in the most disturbingly joyous way possible. Rory, the dead raccoon, stood up on his hind legs. His arms stretched out in glee. He looked like he was the most exciting member of your surprise party or like a time lord in the process of regenerating. Now the raccoon she's talking about is the raccoon on the front of the book, the cover photo, the thumbnail of this video or audio. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, His bafflingly enormous smile caused people to giggle usually nervously and somewhat involuntarily, whenever I presented him or sometimes they'd scream and back away. I guess it depends on if you're expecting an unnaturally cheerful dead raccoon to pop out at you. Victor didn't entirely understand my love for Rory, but he couldn't disagree that Rory was probably the best raccoon corpse that anyone had ever loved. Rory's tiny arms perpetually reached out as if to say, Oh my God, you're my favorite person ever. Please let me chew your face off with my love. Whenever I had accomplished a a particularly impossible goal, like remember to refill my ADD meds, even though I had ADD and was out of ADD meds, Rory was always there, eternally offering supportive high fives because he understood the value of celebrating with small victories. Victor might have refused to congratulate me on the fact that I hadn't fallen down a well that week, but the dead raccoon always had my back, and very few people can say that. 
Very few people would want to say that, Victor corrected. It's just nice to have unconditional encouragement and praise, I explained to him. Some people get all stingy with their high fives, but Rory never leaves me hanging. In fact, it was physically impossible for Rory to leave me hanging, and I momentarily considered having Victor one day taxidermied <laughs> in the same happy <laughs> congratulatory pose, but I realized that no one would recognize him and he'd probably just look sarcastic like he always like he only offering excuse me like he was only offering me high fives when I slipped on things that weren't there when the electricity was cut off because I forget to pay attention again folks I've said this before I have anxiety myself and it causes my gears to get ahead of myself so if I have to stop and repeat sentences, this is the reason why I get way too far ahead of myself and I rush. Onward. Victor thinks taxidermy is a waste of money, claiming that there are only so many things you can do with your dead raccoon. But I have proven him wrong time and time again. Victor pointed out that he'd actually said was there were only so many things you could do with a dead raccoon. And honestly, that does sound more like something he'd say. But I still disagree. When Victor was making Skype calls for work, I silently crawled up behind him and have Rory slowly and menacingly rise up over Victor's shoulder until the person on call froze because they noticed that a mentally unbalanced raccoon <coughs> excuse me, was leaning in like a furry eavesdropping, page-turning serial killer. Then Victor would realize Rory was behind him and he'd sigh and sigh. He does so well and remind himself to lock his office door. If anything, though, Victor should have thanked me because the perfect test to see if your friends and coworkers really have your back is if they are willing to say, hey, there's a raccoon creeping up on you. It's like, is my fly down? But sometimes 1,000 because almost anyone can relay enough to clear their throat and raise an eyebrow at your junk until you realize you forgot to zip, but it takes really concerned badass to interrupt a conference call and say, watch out for that motherfucking raccoon, dude. To their credit, most of Victor's callers would mention something and I'd point out that they'd pass the test and then Rory would be like, jazz hands. <laughs> Then Victor would lock us both out and I'd stick Rory's paw under his office door and say in small raccoony voice, I'm trying to help you. Let me help you. When the mailman dropped off packages, I'd open the door with a few inches and have Rory peek outside. Well, hello, Rory would say in a snooty British accent. <laughs> Should I try that again, folks? Well, hello. Is that British? I don't know. I don't know if that's British. My accents are terrible. I hope you don't need a signature because I seem to have misplaced my opposable thumbs. <laughs> Again, I don't know if that's British or not. <coughs> Excuse me. Eventually, the mailman just stopped ringing the doorbell and would leave the packages on the porch, <laughs> which was nice because it cut down on all awkward small talk. Sometimes I'd hide him under the covers. Rory, not the mailman. So that when Victor turned down, the, turned down the bed, there was Rory on his pillow, as if to say, Surprise, motherfucker! There's a dead raccoon in your bed, and he wants to, some sort of snuggling. <laughs> then Victor would glare at me and make me switch pillows with him. Victor can't understand Rory's frenzied kind of love, but I think he's starting to accept the fact this is my love language. Other women might show their adoration, and big goods and hand knitted slippers, but mine is channeled through animal corpses. Victor tries to interpret it as best as he can, but he is a guy who keeps his emotions close to his vest when it comes to dead animals in bed. So honestly, it's hard to know what the man is really thinking. He's an enigma, that one. Sorry, guys, had to pause out and take a drink. I had a coughing fit. Last night, I realized that Rory was perfectly suited to ride on the cats. As if they are 
were small furry horses and he was a rodeo star. But apparently, the cats didn't realize how awesome it would be and if they were incredibly uncooperative. I tried to create a photo montage of Rory, the rodeo raccoon, but they weren't having it. I suspect if my cats had Instagram, they'd be all over this, but they don't, so they couldn't be bothered. I'd perch Rory on the backs, and they'd stand still for a second, but by the time I backed up and got them in focus, they'd run around like, What are you doing? Why is there a raccoon on my back? Why do they even let you be in charge of things? <laughs> and then they'd just flop over on their sides like a bunch of ingrates who didn't understand art. Rory would have gently tumbled onto the floor, which I suspected sent the cat's mixed messages because he was still waving his hands in the air like he just didn't care. As if he was celebrating the cats being assholes, and I was like, you're killing me, Smalls. But then he just celebrated the fact I was frustrated. Honestly, it's impossible to stay mad at that, that raccoon. Sometime around 2 a.m., Ferris Mueller finally gave up, stayed upright, annoyed, but re resigned, as he carried an ecstatic Rory on his back. And I was like, yes, Ferris Mueller, you are America's next top model. But then Victor opened the bedroom door and yelled, what in the hell is going on out there? It's two o'clock in the damn morning. And Ferris panicked and all the unexpected yelling and tore off down the hall. But Rory was still on his, was still stuck to his back. And Ferris streaked through the living room. And then Victor was like, holy shit, what in the hell was that? Because I guess his eyes hadn't adjusted to the light, or maybe the sight of an ecstatic raccoon frolicking bareback on a house cat. Considering acting just as shocked, and he was claiming it was probably a small capybara, Yeah, I think that's how you say that. Uh, <laughs> the head sm snuck in. But then I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, but then I thought that would just raise more questions instead of I lowered the camera and said, what was what? As innocently as possible, I prayed he'd just go away questioning his sanity. And he did, but probably less because I fooled him and more because it, he'd married someone who took secret pictures of cats wearing dead raccoons in the wee hours of the morning. It wasn't my fault, though. I had chronic in insomnia for as long as I can remember. These are the things that eventually happen when you're alone at 2 a.m. often enough. That's almost like people with anxiety. This is off the book, guys. People with anxiety lay in bed. And at 2 a.m., you might think of something absolutely silly, like, where's my birth certificate? Or just sporadic random thoughts, or did I lock the doors to my car? Even though out of habit, most people do. Or, <clears throat> I don't know, just, just something completely random, like, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, continuing with the book. Editor. These are in parentheses. Remember three pages ago when you said you were lo when you lost your arms? Remember that? How have we not gotten to that yet? Did you forget that's what this story was about? And parentheses. Beginning a new parentheses. Me. I was just getting there. You, you can't just start off a story about missing arms without proper context apparently and parentheses i finally went up i finally went to sleep at 3 a.m woke up a few hours later to take Haley to school Haley is her daughter by the way and then crawled back into bed for a quick nap it was lovely but at 9 30 the alarm rang i i had set my phone excuse me let me back up here i'd set on my phone went off. I could just completely screw that sentence up. Let me read it again. It was lovely, but at 9.30, the alarm I'd set on my phone went off. There we go. I tried to reach over to turn it off, and there, and that's when I realized that my, my left arm was missing. 
Oh boy, here we go. And I thought, well, that's odd. But then I looked over my arm and was like, wait, no, there it is. It was flung awkwardly over my head and was completely numb because Hunter S. Tomcat was lying on it and had cut off the circulation. I threw my shoulder toward the phone and Hunter grudgingly rolled over. But my arm just fell forward, zombie-like. My hand almost grazed the phone, but I couldn't get my fingers to work enough to hit the snooze button. I glared furiously at my fingers like I was trying to technically move an inanimate object, except the in- inanimate object was my own hand. <coughs> Excuse me. The alarm got louder, so I tried to prop myself up with my other am- my other arm, but I ended just flopping around like a fish out of water because my other arm was pinned behind me and was also asleep. Before I go any farther, have any of you guys ever had both of your arms fall asleep? I have many a times, and this literally is the most helpful feeling in the world. And let me explain this before I continue. I used to have seizures, and I lost control of my body limbs, basically my body, and not having control of my arms was one of them. So it brought a lot of fear into me that, oh no, I don't have control of my arms. Am I having a seizure? But what always brought me back to not having a seizure was my arms were tingling. When I had seizures, I had grandma seizures, by the way, my arms would not tingle. Uh, One of my arms, very seldom both, would fly out of control. Um... My eyes would roll back in my head. I'd thrash around. Uh, The doctor even told my parents that I fling my arms so hard that if I was to hit somebody in the head, I would probably kill them as hard as I swing. So if somebody is having a seizure, um, I know you're supposed to lay them on their side, but if they are flailing, Leave them alone. That's what I was told. Anyway, continuing with this chapter. After she said, I was also asleep. Sentence continues. This has never happened to me before, and it seemed such an astronomically weird coincidence that I started to worry that I was accidentally in some partial coma that only affects my arms. Or maybe I'd been giving select... I had been selectively paralyzed, but that seemed unlikely since most people who have been paralyzed say, I can't feel my legs, rather than, my arms stop working. Hunter walked around to stare at me like, why aren't you turning off the noise? What is wrong with you? Which is very unhelpful. I managed to Frankenstein myself up into a sitting position. (laughs) I've done this before. And kept tossing (laughs) helpless arms. (laughs) <laughs> near, near the snooze button, but it wouldn't work. <laughs> I have totally gone through this before, so I know how ridiculous this looks. <laughs> and it got louder and louder, and I couldn't hear Victor angrily stomping toward the bedroom, yelling, Oh my God, are you still in bed? <laughs> I didn't want to tell him that not only was I still in bed, but also my arms weren't even awake yet. <laughs> And I panicked and quickly rolled off the edge of the bed and hid behind it. <clears throat> Obviously, I wasn't thinking straight because I forgot I didn't have because I forgot that I didn't have arms to help catch me. <laughs> and I landed face down with a dull thud. And then when I realized how helpful it was to have working arms. You ever think to appreciate your you never think to appreciate your arms until you need them to stop the floor from punching you in the face. Hunter S. Tomcat looked over the edge of the bed and quizzically, as if to say, What in the hell are you doing? If the floor <clears throat> excuse me, if there food down there is there food down there? And he dropped to the floor beside me to check it out. Victor burst in yelling, Why is your alarm blaring? Some of us are on a conference calls, you know. And I heard him huff and switch off the alarm. I looked at Hunter like, shh, say nothing and we'll be fine. And he stared back at me like, 
What do you mean, we? <laughs> oh, oh, man. I told you guys from the get-go this is going to be uh, comical. Amanda, again, thank you, honey, for letting me, or, yeah, letting me know about this book. This is, this is great. Um, Victor paused, and I saw his feet moving towards the bathroom, where he looked for me, and then he came back in. It was like, where are you? But I stayed quiet and waited for him to leave so I could sneak out to my desk and pretend I'd been up for hours. My plan would have been, would have worked perfectly if Hunter hadn't decided to jump onto my hip so he could peer over the side of the bed and look at Victor like, why are you people doing this? Is this a game? Then Victor walked around the bed and sighed and said, no one is here. But it sounded muffled because on the floor, he accused me of hiding from him rather than working, and I said, no, actually, I'm down here trying to save you from the sight of your disabled and temporary, temporary paralyzed wife because I'm trying to protect you. Then Victor gave me what I guess was a look of pity or maybe love. I don't know because I was still facing the floor, but I'm giving him the benefit of the, of the doubt. That's what marriage is all about. I suddenly realized that all of this might make a pretty good chapter and I wanted to write it down, but I still didn't have, still didn't have arms to write. So instead I said, I've actually been down here working on my book, but I don't have a way to type. Can you turn, can you just turn on the voice recognition part of my phone and lay it by my face so I can dictate notes because my arms don't work right now? And Victor said, your arms don't work right now? And I said, yes, apparently I slept wrong and lost circulation and they're both still asleep. Holy crap, he said, you're so lazy that even your limbs are still sleeping while I'm talking to you. <laughs> Quite the contrary, I explained as I struggled to roll off, roll over on my back. I'm, I'm so hardworking that I'm awake even, th even when my body is still partially unconscious and I'm like, Fuck you, arms. I'm still, I'll still be productive without you. That's how I dedicated I am. I was starting to get some of the feeling back in my left arm <clears throat> and lifted it to try to brush my hunter away from my nose, but instead I just smacked myself in the face. Victor stared at me with concerned resignation. <coughs> Excuse me. You just hit yourself. It is possible my arms might be rebelling. Just put the phone next to my face and leave me. I have important work to do here. He shook his head and with disappointment, but still he did it and I, start, and I started dictating. But the transcription app kept auto-correcting my story to something less ridiculous because even my phone was against me at that point. Side note, my, dicto my dictation, excuse me, on my iPhone 13 Pro Max is absolutely effing terrible. I can dictate with proper dictation, like that, dictation, and it'll still not recognize what I'm trying to say. My dictation, sometimes when I say dad, it'll spell out dead or did. No, dad, D-A-D. So sometimes I have to say father. Anyway, continuing on. Then Hunter saw the words on my phone moving and he kept pouncing on it and resetting the cursor. I laid my head down on the rug in defeat as the pain of the pins and needles flooded my arms and wondered how often this sort of shit happened to Hemingway. Victor claims these, thing, these kind of things don't go <clears throat> on in normal households, but I'm pretty sure this entire incident could be blamed on the fact that I have several real-life sleep disorders. This is not too surprising considering I collect neurological disorders like other people collect comic books. Basically, I've become so talented at having disorders that I can literally have one in my sleep. Victor doesn't think this is really something to brag about, but that's probably because he doesn't have any disorders and he's jealous. Jesus, it's not a competition, Victor. But if it were a competition, I'd be winning, handedly. Victor had been pushing me to do, into doing a sleep study for years, but I'd felt it was a waste of time and money. I already knew I had problem. I already knew I had a problem, so I didn't really want proof I was fucked up, even when I was unconscious. Besides, I wasn't the only one 
with sleep problems, as Victor had been talking in his sleep since he was a kid. When he was eight, he was traveling with his dad and sat up in a darkened hotel room at 2 a.m. Page turning. Opened his eyes and raised his arm to a point to point towards the dark hall, saying, Who's that man standing in the corner? Then he lay back down and went straight back to sleep while his father quietly shit himself. <laughs> Metaphorically, probably. <laughs> <coughs> Now, I have dated some girls who have talked in their sleep, um, and I have full, I'm a light sleeper. I fully woke up and answered them and got really mad when they didn't answer me back because I thought they were avoiding me, but then quickly remembered, oh, she's sleep talking. Anyway, a few weeks, a few weeks ago, Victor woke himself up yelling, lady, you have the wrong number. Our cat isn't even in the hospital. He doesn't want pajamas. <laughs> Oh, man. Poor Victor. Even in his sleep, he's plagued by assholes. <laughs> it might be hereditary because my dad also has major sleep issues. I never really noticed it when I was a kid because you always assume that your family is normal until you realize that no one else's father stops people in the middle of their conversation to tell them he needs a quick nap and then lies down on their living room floor for 20 minutes to snore so loudly as seems as if he's the big bad wolf, but in reverse, no matter where or who we were with, my dad would often stop, lie down, and immediately go to sleep, and he'd wake himself up choking on a snore. <laughs> Once, Victor took my dad deep sea fishing during a storm, and the boat rocked a little like mad, and there was water. All right, I lost my place. Uh, rocking like mad, and there was water and blood on the bottom of the boat, and everyone was seasick. And Daddy said, "Well, if no one else is joking to take, it, going to take a nap, I will." And he lay down in fish blood and slept soundly, but not soundlessly, for forty minutes. To Victor and everyone else on the boat, this seemed insane, but to me it seemed normal, and I thought Victor was overreacting and should just. Count himself lucky that my dad had kept his pants on. <laughs> I inherited insomnia from my mom and the snoring daytime sleepness, sleep, sleepiness from my dad. I also came up with my own brand of exhaustion and choking-related awesomeness, and Victor eventually said he couldn't take it anymore and made me get help. My doctor thought I, most likely, I was most likely snoring and exhausted because of the insomnia and prescribed hypnotic sedative. It works really well for people, for normal people. But the first time I took it, I waited for it to make me sleepy and it never did. Several hours later, Victor found me in the closet where I claimed I could see through postcards and I found the fifth dimension. Victor assumed I would had some sort of breakdown, <laughs> which is insulting because it's entirely possible that I did find the fifth dimension and he wasn't giving me the benefit of the doubt. Instead, <laughs> he just put me to bed and called the doctor, who explained that she'd forgotten to tell me that I'd have to go to bed immediately after I take the pill or my body will stay awake while my brain goes to sleep. She told Victor that the that same thing had happened to her father, who was found wandering the front yard wearing only socks, Asking the trees why they hated him. <laughs> oh, man. This is great because I can relate. <clears throat> Her mom ended up taking him to the ER because she assumed he must have had a stroke. The whole story freaked me out, so I threw away the sedatives. All hope of visiting the fifth dimension. And instead told Victor I'd go for a sleep study if he promised to stop videotaping me snoring and playing in next to me to wake me up so I could feel his pain. I made an appointment to, with the sleep doctor who explained that during the sleep study people would be watching me and monitoring my brain waves to see how I reacted during the four stages of sleep. I'd explain the stages if I could sleep. All the complicated words, excuse me, let me reread that. I'd explain the stages if I could spell all the complicated words 
but they basically ranged from wide awake to just barely not dead. My sleep, my sleep cycle is a bit elab, more elaborate. Continuing on. The seven stages of sleep, according to my body. Stage one, you take the maximum dose of sleeping pills, but they don't work at all. Then you glare their smug bottles at 3 a.m., whispering, you lying bastards. Stage two, you fall asleep for eight minutes and you have the dream where you've missed a semester of classes and you don't know where you're supposed to be when you wake up and you realize that even in sleep, you're fucking your life up. Stage three, you close your eyes for just a minute, but never lose consciousness. And then you open your eyes and realize it's been hours since you close your eyes and you feel like you've lost time and were probably abducted by aliens. Stage four, this is the sleep that you miss because you're too busy looking up symptoms of alien abductions on your phone. Stage five. All right. So before I read stage five, I just want to say, like, I'm not a hypochondriac, but when it comes to my health, I take it seriously. So I nosedive or completely dick dive, as some people would say, into the internet and... So many symptoms are related to so many illnesses. You think you have something that probably is not what the internet says it is or what your mind says it is. Anxiety can make your mind think of the worst things possible. Okay, so stage five. This is the deep REM sleep or REM sleep that recharges you completely and doesn't actually exist, but is made up by other people to taunt you. Stage six, you hover in a state of half sleep when you're trying to stay under, but someone is touching your nose and you think it's a dream, but now someone is touching your mouth and you open your eyes and it's your cat's face and it's an inch from yours. And he's like, boop, I got your nose. Stage seven, you finally fall into the deep sleep you desperately need. Sadly, this sleep comes from comes after you're supposed to be awake and you feel guilty about getting it because you should have been up hours ago, but you've been up all night and now your arms are missing. I sus- I suspected <clears throat> Okay, yes, that was stage 7. Moving on with the chapter. I suspected that the only stage of sleep I'd have during the sleep study would be the sleep you didn't get because strangers are watching you. It was disheart, disconcert. Oh my gosh. It was disconcert. Disconcerting. I can't. My brain is not functioning today. Right from the beginning, because I went after sundown and the entrance to the clinic was literally in a dark back alley. I knocked on the locked door, which startled a homeless man who had been ironically or possibly sarcastically sleeping heavily, and I was fairly certain that this was the sort of place that would probably sell abortions by the dozen. But then the nurse opened the door, and it was very bright and pleasant and not very abortion-y at all. But they put me in a bedroom, and the nurse asked if I wanted to change into pajamas. I self-consciously explained that the sweats I was wearing were my pajamas, and I felt like I was imp- improperly dressed for sleep. Aside from that, though, it was just like being home, except for the video camera. The constant observation, the oxygen tubes up my nose and monitors taped to my fingers and electrodes glued to my scalp to track my brain waves. The electrode wires... Sorry, lost my place. The electrode wires were the most uncommon favorable uncomfortable because they ran all over my head like I was Medusa with a bunch of anorexic snake hair. The silver lining was the weight of the wires pulled my face back like a mini facelift. So I, so I looked and there's a picture of Jenny uh, that I will impose on this uh, screen Uh, And the caption to the picture says, because nothing says sweet dreams like electrodes and wires from your ankle to scalp. So the last sentence was, 
The silver lining was the weight of the wires pulled my face back like a mini facelift, and so I looked surprisingly sexy if you ignored all the anorexic snakes on my head. The nurse continually readjusted forehead electrodes because she said they weren't picking up any signal, and I'm pretty sure that's an insult. <laughs> Um, my nurse warned me that one of the patients was a sleepwalker, but if, but that if he walked into my room, they'd come get him. And that was comforting in a way that, that wasn't really comforting at all. After several hours of staring at the ceiling, I drifted off, I drifted off to sleep and woke up to a sound of a woman next door screaming manically. And I assumed she had been stabbed to death by the sleepwalker. I shot bolt right up upright but the snakes in my hair were attached to the wall behind me so they jerked me back down to the bed i thought to myself well this is really fucked up way to die the nurse rushed in to assure me that everything was fine and that the screaming woman just suffered from night terrors i nodded agree agreeably as i watched the sleepwalker knock over a chair outside my door i briefly considered escaping but i was lightly shackled to the bed by wires and monitors plus the nurses orderlies were watching me and for a minute i realized this was probably a lot like being in a mental institution except even crazier because we'd all come here voluntarily like some sort of terrible slumber party for weirdos i was certain i wouldn't sleep again but i must have because at 4 a.m a different nurse shook me awake and bruise bruise bruisically said you can go now we got what we needed she refused to tell me exactly what it was they got they had gotten and i started to sus suspect it was my kidneys i was groggy but they made me leave out the back door while it was still dark i was like i'd had one night stand with a sleep clinic <clears throat> a week later my doctor had my results informed me that i have pretty much all of the sleep disorders except for the only one that I'd wanted to have, which is apnea. One where they give you that headgear that shoots oxygen up your nose. I wanted it because I'm pretty sure the smaller version of that oxygen chamber that Michael Jackson slept in to stop him. Oh my gosh. That smaller version of that oxygen chamber that Michael Jackson slept in to stop him from aging and things seemed to work out pretty well for him. Sadly, I didn't have sleep apnea, but I had a number of issues, a few things that were wrong with me when I'm not even conscious. So continuing on here, I had to pause for a minute, guys. Periodic limb movements during sleep. Again, this is uh, the thing she's describing of her sleep. It's like restless leg syndrome, but it only happens after you're unconscious. I'm fine with it, though, because I think it means my legs are jogging without me, which is honestly the, the only way you could ever get me to jog. When I was little, I had a dog, I think that was this... Excuse me, let me start over. When I, I was little, we had a dog that I think had the same issue because he was always running while asleep on his side and we would look at his twitchy legs and say aw he's chasing rabbits in his sleep it's pretty much the most adorable sleep disorder ever except according to victor my version is not so much running adorably as it is some sort of ongoing exorcism with all of the terrifying jerking and writhing about snoring they didn't tell me choking during the sleep study. All right, let me start that over. Snoring. They didn't see me choking during the sleep study, but I often wake up choking and snoring loudly. Although, maybe that's because Victor's choking me for snoring loudly. I did not... I did snore a lot, though. My doctor prescribed me clips that go inside of your nostrils to make it easier to breathe, except that you have clips in your nostrils now, so it actually makes it harder to breathe. I already, I tried it exactly once, which was enough to realize 
that the real snoring cure here was to show suffocation, to slow suffocation, excuse me, which admittedly is very, is a very quiet death. I also had an allergic reaction to the plugs and both nostrils swelled up. This seemed like a more economical and organic way of smothering to death, but I still prefer snoring to asphyxiation. Call me crazy. A couple more pages to go here, guys. Seizures. Okay, now this is where it gets a little personal for me. It looks like you might have an uncommon seizure disorder, but there's no real cure for it. I asked the doctor what the point of even telling me about it was then. Just keep an eye on it, he replied. I'm not sure how I keep an eye on a disorder that only happens when I'm unconscious. I couldn't even tell if I was being sar sarcastic or not. Alpha intrusion. When you're asleep, you're supposed to have delta brain waves, but apparently my brain is constantly getting interrupted. Sorry, my cat is getting into something she shouldn't be. With alpha waves. So I'm flooded with an awake-like brain activity while my body is asleep, which means even when I'm asleep, I'm still awake. I suspect my brain is working in collusion with my legs and my whole body is forcing me to do algebra and work out while I'm asleep. It's no wonder I'm so damn tired. And now I think about it. Alpha intrusion is also about part of you being asleep like the rest of you being awake. Just like my arms this morning. Bam. It's like my brain just did a mic drop there. Okay, moving onward. I had uh, a friend stop by to drop off a few things. So, when I told Victor the results, he didn't take them very seriously until I pointed out the most, that most people with alpha intrusion die. Then he looked concerned and I felt bad, so I admitted that they actually don't die from alpha intrusion. <laughs> just, just, you know, most people die, eventually. I can't imagine intrusion helps, though. Victor sighed and assured me that no one ever died from not enough sleep. But I'm pretty sure they have, and he paused for correct and corrected himself. Maybe it's no one ever died from too much sleep. And I was like, I think you just described, described the coma. This isn't helping. Fine, he said. Everyone has to die of something. You probably are not going to die of, <clears throat> of sleep. And he's wrong because, best case scenario, I die in my sleep, and I'll go to bed. And then I'll never wake up. Worst case scenario, I'm eaten by clowns. Randomness. This is how this is how people's minds work. A footnote on Rory, the taxidermied raccoon. There are actually two Rorys. Rory and his stunt double, Rory 2. The first time I saw Rory was on the internet and I fell in love with and fell in love and told his maker, Jeremy, that I wanted to have him. I explained how Rory perfectly displayed the furiously happy smile. Jeremy agreed. Sadly, in between my falling in love with this photo and actually paying for him, Rory was involved in a tragic roller coaster accident in Vegas. This sounds like something I just made up, but I assure you it's true. Rory's temporary guardians had taken him on a debaucherous Vegas weekend and debaucherous, I believe that's how that's pronounced, Vegas weekend, and he'd broken a few limbs. He'd also left all of his fingers and toes behind, proving the old a adage, <clears throat> what happens to break off in Vegas? Jeremy was furious and broke the news to me gently, and he vowed to make me another Rory, better, stronger, and with wires inside, so he, po so he was posable and could more effectively ride on the cats. With a raccoon corpse, he had his in his freezer. How does the first Rory's face look, I asked, still pleased as a, as a damn punch, he admitted. But the rest of him is a hot mess. I considered it for a moment and decided that a broken and tattered but still ecstatically happy Rory was pretty much exactly what being furiously happy was all about. After all, the most interesting of us have been broken and mended and broken again. I'll take him, I said. Hell, I'll even take them both. And that's how I became to own two furiously happy raccoons. 
<clears throat> and I have the flexible perfection of Rory 2, who is slightly larger, but you can't be picky when you're only dealing with roadkill raccoons. But Rory 1 is the only one who makes me laugh every time I look at him. Jeremy had mended his broken arm and leg, and my father spent an afternoon sculpting new fingers and toes for him. Rory still looks a bit off, but in a good sort of way. And I <laughs> currently, <laughs> I'm currently looking for infant-sized <clears throat> adamantium wolverine claws for him. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. <clears throat> but even without the claws, he's lovely. Broken in flaws, so strange, but even people who like taxidermy still think, what the shit is going on here? Even as he's bringing joy and laughter into their lives, the raccoon is my goddamn role model. He is the worst and most patronious ever. Patronus ever. He is the worst and best patronus ever. I don't know if that's the right word to put there, or even if I said it right. And I want to just like him. I want to be just like him when I grow up. <clears throat> and there is a picture here that I will impose on this as well. They're doing it again, aren't they? There's a picture of her cat, and the caption says, Yes, yes they are. That is the end of chapter four, my friends. Um, that one was definitely a little bit longer. It took me 45 minutes to read that, 46 minutes to read that, uh, probably with all the backtracking, but this was... Like I said, one of the longer chapters. And again, I'll superimpose some pictures here. Um, if you like this, I hope you guys will keep listening. Uh, again, I know I stutter and I have to repeat myself. <clears throat> um, but again, my anxiety just goes over overboard. I get ahead of myself. Um, I need to go pick up my script. They owe me actually 25 capsules. Uh, they were only give, able to give me a five-day dose, or yeah, one, I take one pill a day for five days. Uh, so, but anyway, furiously happy, Jenny Lawson, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will get out chapter five when I sit down, when I want to sit down and feel like reading again. Until next time, y'all stay safe, stay healthy, y'all be good to each other. <clears throat>